Uh, we have the URL of all the slides, exercises uh, available right here. If you go to that link, uh, as we've already talked about, you'll get a page that looks like this. Uh, if you are not used to Git or GitHub, it may look a little intimidating. The solution to that is just click on this download zip uh, over here in the bottom right-hand corner and you'll get a zip file with all the contents uh, from, from what we're going to work on. So uh, you don't have to worry about source code control or pull requests or anything at all. You can just grab that and use it. All right? And you'll also want to have a Python installation with NumPy and with Matplotlib uh, installed. Those are really the only tools, I think, that we have to use during this uh, uh, tutorial. So it's really a fairly basic installation. I'll be teaching from Canopy using Python 2.7, whatever we're on now. Um, I think you'll be fine if you're using uh, uh, any other distribution, whether it be from the Python website or, or Anaconda and also uh, I think you'll probably be, if you're using Python 3, you'll probably know the little changes you need to make on print statements and that sort of thing as we go through if there's anything like that. So everything should hold pretty well as we go through things. All right? Uh, I appreciate everybody here being here. Eight o'clock's quite early to start something for a group of geeks, and we're doing pretty well. I think we're supposed to have about 60 people, and I think we're still... Uh, a little bit short of that number, so uh, there may be people filtering in and filling in to sit next to you. Uh, so don't be uh, surprised if that happens as we as we go. Of course, we have a fully empty front row, and it will probably remain that way unless there's no other options, right? All right, and and it's great that you got here even after all of your celebrating last night for the women's soccer win. How about that? Did y'all see that? Unless you're Japanese, and I apologize. That was probably not appropriate in that case. But could you believe that, that goal from half field? That was amazing. I haven't seen something like that in forever. Uh, I think there's a, a YouTube of Beckham doing one of those. Like, but that was like 10 years ago or something. It was an awesome game, a lot of fun to watch. All right. So, NumPy, how many people here are familiar with Python already? How many people are familiar with NumPy? All right, so the, it, it's about half. Um, how many people just started using Python and NumPy within the last year? Okay, it's quite a few. One of the interesting things that we had for the conference this year, actually, that mirrors that pretty well is 60% of the people, or last time I checked, uh, it was their first time attending. And that's remarkable to us. We've never had a number so high. We're used to having kind of this incremental growth with probably uh, 60 to 70% of the people uh, from the old guard. But uh, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Uh, and uh, so excited to see the adoption of this tool set. It's quite powerful. Uh, and we'll be going over a lot of that today. The, the talk, does anybody know what the schedule's supposed to be? We go from 8 to 12, and I expect there's a break somewhere in there. Are there is there one or two? Well, one, 12, 12, one. 12 to 1 is lunch, and then the next two will start to 1. But is there a break in the morning during this? Or are you guys going to hold your bladders all the way through? It's up through? to you. Yeah, it's, up to you. it's up to me. Yeah, all right. So it depends upon your endurance level, huh? Don't drink much coffee or you'll be in trouble. <laughs> Uh, no, so we'll probably do a break as I see you nodding off or so around, well, if it happens too early, I'll throw something at you, but around 10 o'clock or so, we'll try to take a break. How does that sound? All right. Now, the material I'm going through, I've trimmed it down some, uh, but I often will teach it in a day instead of a half day. So we have a uh, kind of a, a, a quick schedule here. On the other end, I'm not somebody who likes to move really, really fast on my material. I'd much rather you uh, uh, understand what we're doing. Uh, and so what we're going to do is go through this material till we get to where we can't go any further because we run out of time. 
uh, and we'll try to cover the basics. And if we get to the end and we're missing some topics that I think are really uh, critical, I'll, I'll uh, resort to talking a little bit on the board and ad hocly so that you can um, uh, get a flavor of the, of the ending pieces. But we're not going to go into like reading binary file to a structured arrays or anything like that. This is really to get you off the ground. Uh, you've seen this NumPy thing. You've probably used it along with Matplotlib for plotting. Let's get a little more of the details of how this thing works and how do I use this uh, in, um, uh, in earnest and work, OK? Are there any questions before we get going? It's good. I haven't confused you yet. All right. So. <coughs> What is this NumPy thing, and where does it sit in the stack? I actually, uh, there, there's one bar at the bottom that's actually missing out of this drawing, and that is I'd rather have a bar at the bottom called Python, right? And then sitting on top of Python, you can think about this toolbox or, or library called NumPy. And then sitting on top of that really is SciPy and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? There, there's this huge number of libraries. but. This is a pretty good uh, illustrative drawing to give you an idea. I think, how many people are familiar with MATLAB? Goodness, that was slow. That's a, you, it's a, the world's changing. That used to be every hand in the room when we would ask that. Uh, so MATLAB is kind of uh, the, the alternative to Python in the engineering and um, science world. Uh, some people use IDL as well, but that world is shrinking. Uh, so it used to be MATLAB. If you go to any undergraduate electrical engineering class, take a class on signal processing, uh, inevitably the, the, the material will be in MATLAB. And MATLAB is kind of this language that, that has, it's a programming language, but it has built-in support for things like arrays. And I think about Python plus NumPy as being the equivalent uh, or the analogy to MATLAB. And then if you look at SciPy, that's equivalent to the toolboxes that you buy for MATLAB. So you can think about Python and NumPy as, as that core together. Um, yes? So can you take one of those running tests? Oh, sure. Uh, anybody else need a writing pad? Or No, that's great. No, clearly you hit upon a need, right? <laughs> so we're good. All right, so that's the basic layer. So what we're going to be talking about is this layer that is the array library uh, uh, or array data structure in Python. And there are actually two things that come in NumPy. There are a lot of things that come in NumPy, but there are two basic data structures. One is called an ND array. And the other is called a u-func, or a universal function. We're not going to talk about universal functions much at all, because they're really hidden. They're kind of uh, the guys behind the scenes that make the show go on, but uh, they don't really have a starring role. A and they're going to be things that you do your add, and subtract, and sign, and cosine. All of those things are implemented as a u-func in Python, or in, in NumPy. And the machinery of UFUNCs allows those operations to, to happen very quickly. So we're just going to use them. The one we're going to talk about, and the star of our show, is the ND Array. Except we never call him ND Array. We call him Array. And from henceforward, I won't say ND Array. I'll just say Arrays. 
Uh, and that's what you'll use a, as the name there. But if you dig down into the infrastructure, you'll notice that the class is actually called India right there. All right? There's also a, a, a number of other uh, libraries uh, that, that came along with NumPy largely from historic reasons. You have uh, FFTs, LinAlge, random numbers, uh, 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 these libraries were built into NumPy early on because it was viewed way back in 94 when Jim Huguenin first wrote um, the, the numeric library. It was kind of, hey, we need to replace MATLAB. So he started putting all these things in. And it's useful because we need a lot of these functions, but it became too unwieldy to build all of those at the same time that you're building the data structures. So those really moved up into SciPy. There are vestiges of those there, but just don't use them, <laughs> I guess, is the way to think about this. FFT and LinAlge, the ones in SciPy are, are going to have more care and attention spent on them. Uh, the one exception I might make to that is the random uh, library, and you may use that uh, in a number of places, okay? But we're gonna talk about arrays primarily. Uh, you know, there's just a few facts around this. It's a big project now, uh, a lot of downloads, uh, a lot of releases, and, and, you know, one of the fun things is it ships on OS uh, 10. Uh, that was kind of when we knew we had made it, uh, is when an operating system started including all of this stuff. All right? Helpful sites. <clears throat> if you go to docs.scipy.org and go to the doc page, there's uh, a list of several references that, that are available there. A really nice reference to go to uh, that I like really well is this NumPy example list with doc uh, that's shown on the far side over there. And the reason I like that is uh, you can t open this page, you'll have like 400 functions uh, from, from Python that are from NumPy that are there. And a lot of times it's hard to do reverse lookups in the documentation for Python. So if you're looking for something like covariance or something like that, then you have to know exactly the name of the function that you're looking for. With this page, you can type in covariance and you'll get a number of hits and you can go and just look and see the example there. And the awesome thing is that when you click on something like abs here, that's gonna take you to an example of using that function. Uh, really nice uh, page to use, okay? All right, so if you're getting started with NumPy, there are a number of things uh, to, that, that you'll notice, especially if you're, how many of you are using uh, uh, a command, an IPython command prompt? Okay, how many are using no notebooks? Okay, so it's about half and half. I'll be using uh, command prompts because Old habits die hard, right? You get used to one system and you like it. Um, the, the way that this works is when, when Canopy starts up or if you've started IPython uh, with the dash dash PyLab like this at a command line, or if you start up a notebook, uh, and I think you still have to do dash dash PyLab when you do that, maybe not. You guys would, uh, would know better the notebook users. But once you do that, if you, if you just type array down here, you will get uh, something happening. It'll return to you a value. It doesn't complain and say that thing doesn't exist. Uh, on the other hand, if you just go into, let me get a bash shell. If you just start up Python, if I say array, I'm not gonna see anything. It says name error. There's no array here. So you're gonna to have to say from NumPy, import array. And then after that, you can say array, right? So in some of these, uh, in Canopy, in IPython with the dash PyLab, it's basically done an import that looks like this, from NumPy, import star. Now, if you're not familiar with that syntax, what that means is NumPy has all of these functions. I want to import all of those functions and make them available to me at the command line or in my script. At the command line, it's this very nice way of speeding up your uh, uh, work, right? You can just do that and you have everything available. In your scripts, 
Uh, it's a great way to get hit over the head with a wet noodle by your compatriots at work because now they have to read your code with all of these import stars in them and they don't know where the heck any of the functions you're using are coming from. So while uh, it's perfectly fine, I think, to do this sort of behavior from NumPy import star at the command line, doing it in your, uh, your work code, uh, in your scripts that you write or in your applications that you write, not that great of an idea. Now, I'm not gonna hit you over the head with a wet noodle if you do it in the scripts and exercises that we do today just to save time. But instead of doing that, what we've tried to do in all the exercises is do an import for you that has all the correct names, like array, sine, cosine, whatever you might need in that uh, uh, exercise, okay? Uh, the other thing that you'll notice often if you read code on the net um, is you might say, see people say, import numpy as np. How many people have seen that? Yeah. And, and there are a number of places where this is very much the preferred behavior on things. Um, I think it's a great way to do things. Now, if you have this, instead of being able to say array, you would say np.array. And what you're doing is referring to the in numpy namespace or module and asking for the array function out, out of it. This is a really clean way of getting a short name instead of having to type NumPy all the time. You can just type NP and uh, still having access quickly to, to all the functions that live there without polluting the namespace, the main namespace, okay? Either way is fine with me. In our exercises, as you'll look, we'll have things more like this at the top where we import everything that you need from the function or from the library, all right? Okay, so <clears throat> you can either do from numpy import star, you can say from numpy import array, all of these things. You can start with ipython pylab, which is the equivalent of import star, or you can say from numpy, or import numpy as np and use it that way. Uh, all right, let's just do a few operations here, and I'm just gonna move over. Uh, and we'll clear this out. And let's make an array, A. And the first thing you'll notice here is I have started actually, what's highlighted in that? What would the data structure for that be that I just highlighted there? What was that? I heard it. It's a list, yeah. So I'm starting with the list and I'm actually the array, you can think about it as a um, as a conversion function. Uh, it's sitting there and converting a, a sequence, this list in this case, to an actual array. So we take our list and then we call that, and now I have an array with one, two, three, four, five in it. And if I say b is equal to array, and you know what, it can actually be a tuple if you want it to be. It doesn't matter, it's just a sequence Either one, it's, array is just a conversion function that converts a sequence to an array. So now I have A and B. Oh, I didn't make B long enough, just a second. So now I have A and B, and A was created with, and you'll notice I just, if you just type A and hit the up arrow, you can pull back the last time you typed A equal and it will give you that last command. So uh, that's an easy way and so I was I want to look for B where I started with equal. I just hit the up arrow, it finds that command. So those are the two commands that I just ran. And if I take A and I add that to B, if these were lists, what would happen? Does anybody know? It'd be concatenation. Yeah, we would end up with uh, a list that was one, two, three, four, five, and then two, three, four, five, six uh, after that. But if you add these, when you have NumPy arrays, the, the default behavior is to add element by element, which is really, really handy. You know, we're gonna use that a whole lot. This is the basis for pretty much everything we do. So here we've added one and two, and we get three, two and three and get five, three and four and get seven, four and five and get nine, and five and six and get 11, all right? 
Now, I did make a mistake a little earlier, and I'll just put that mistake back in. And I made B a little shorter. What's going to happen if I try to add A and B together when one's not the same length? What's that? You're going to get an error, and it's going to tell you that we can't add. It's a little bit more convoluted. I always love computer scientist error messages, but uh, it is. This is a true statement, but uh, only three people on the planet can understand it. Uh, <laughs> operands could not be broadcast together with shapes five and four. Uh, basically, what this is saying is I can't add two arrays that don't have the same shapes five. Uh, five and four are, are not the same shapes. Now, it's not always the case that everything has to be the same length, right? We have A. What if I come along and I add a one to that? One's not the same length or shape as that array, but this gets towards this name called broadcast here. If I just add A to something that has a value uh, to a scalar, then this scalar is broadcast across all of the elements. It's as if you had an array that had, was full of ones and added that to the, to the element, okay? And it's, it's important to talk about it in the terms of broadcasting I mean, because we'll see, perhaps, if we get there at the end, um, this is actually a, a generic or a generalized form in, Py in Python compared to MATLAB where Arrays actually don't have to be the same shape exactly. This broadcasting behavior, you can kind of upscale arrays so that they uh, will, will broadcast across a 1D array, can be broadcast across a 2D array, much like a scalar can be broadcast a 1D, across a 1D array. So that's a fairly advanced topic, but it's very handy, so we may get there. This idea is exactly the same, though. We just broadcast that value across there. We can also do something like this. I'm just going to go and say, um, oh, let's see. Uh, let's see. I'll do a range. And a range is a function that takes, um, it's like range in Python, but the a in the front of it means that it gives you a value back that is uh, a NumPy array instead of a list. And you'll notice here, I'm going to do one small change. We're going to multiply that times 2 times pi and divide that by 21. And so I get an array here, A, that has values from 0 to 2 pi. And you'll notice this was an array, and then I multiplied it by some scalars, and in the end divided by a scalar, and all of that works fine. Uh, we're just doing, it's 2 pi over 21 times what came from A range, and we get that array. And now I can say B is equal to sine of A. And I can come along and say plot, because matplotlib is also imported. And I'm just going to make my screen a little smaller here. Plots sometimes show up behind the scenes there, and I get our, our, val our, our array there. So the only, when you're at the command line, you don't have to type show most of the time. You have, there is something in matplotlib called uh, uh, interactive plotting on uh, or off. And if you set that to true, which it is when you're, oh, maybe you just have to uh, type I on. I thought you could pass it a, a flag. Uh, by default, though, at the command line, whenever you, Whenever you type a command or type a plotting command, it immediately takes uh, effect. If, on the other hand, you're writing a script and executing the script, you have to have the show command at the end. And the reason for that is, in a script, you may be executing hundreds of plotting commands. Instead of updating the windows all the time and slowing down your, your script, it will wait until it gets the show command and do all of that graphics display at one time. All right. All right. So I think that we've gotten uh, the basics there. Uh, where here we've we've created an array. We've multiplied it by a scalar. You could also do that with the star equal uh, uh, kind of operations in place operations. We've taken the sign and then we've plotted it. All right. 
hopefully you can follow along and, and see that. Now, what I want to do now is because every exercise that we're going to do, pretty much you get your eyes go cross-eyed looking at these arrays on the, uh, you know, on the command line. You really do want to display them most of the time. So every exercise we do is going to have a plot. So I want to go through the matplotlib basics right quick. This is uh, by no means uh, an exhaustive discussion of matplotlib. And this is kind of just the facts, ma'am. Look through the commands that you may want to know and gives you a reference as you start looking at the exercises, all right? So I'll mention the matplotlib website is awesome. Uh, the coolest place to go on there is the gallery. Uh, if you go over here, you can go to this gallery and the whoops, the, the internet's pretty dang good, isn't it? And the awesome thing about this gallery is you can start scrolling through this and it's a really long page of all of these different examples. And you can go to one of these examples, and if you look at it, there's the code that generated it. So you can cut and paste that code and get a quick example of how to do this, right? So if you're interested, uh, you know, you can grab this code. And we'll just come over here. And I'll just run that. So we should have gotten another plot here. And there it is. All right? Really nice way of learning by example. And even to this day, if I have to plot something and I go, I wonder if I go to that page, I scroll down, find one that looks close to what I'm trying to do, I cut and paste that code, and then I start massaging until it looks like what I want. It's a great way to, to, to learn, okay? All right, so <clears throat> a quick run through here. Uh, I think we probably had 40 or 50% of the hands that went up that had at least seen MATLAB. Uh, these functions will look stunningly similar to the MATLAB API if you're used to that. And that's intentional with so many people migrating from that world over to this when John Hunter wrote this library one of his initial intentions was to make that migration as easy as possible. So the API actually follows Mat MATLAB. I don't think it's quite exactly, but there are only a few functions that are either named slightly differently or use different um, uh, arguments. So if I create an X array called linspace plot sine of X, I get a plot and it's sine of X here, which is, uh, encouraging, right? And it's what you would hope it would look like. But notice if you can, uh, aside from the old people on the back line that can't read my, my slides at this size, what is it plotted? Uh, we plotted X, we've only asked it to plot one value, right? We've given it uh, a single uh, array. When you do that, it uses that as the Y value, all right? So the values out of this array have become the amplitudes on the y-axis. And it's used the index of the array on the x-axis. That's the default. If, on the other hand, uh, you want to um, uh, use something other than the index, then you can say plot x versus sine of x. And here we've actually done a little more complicated thing, but imagine I had done that and just closed the plot command right there. If I do that, I would get this single blue line plotted, which looks much like this blue line over here. It goes from negative 1 to 1, but the difference is it goes from 0 to 2 pi, or 0 to 6.28 on the x-axis, instead of 0 to 50. All right? And there's the second uh, uh, thing illustrated here is I can have x versus y, and then I can also add immediately a second set, of, a second line that I wanted to plot. So x versus y, and then x1 versus y1, basically. That's what this second argument is, or second set of arguments. And you can keep doing that. Matplotlibs, or the plot signature, will allow you to provide 
x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y3 and continue doing that and you'll get however many lines you've stuck in all right there are a lot of little uh, uh, functions on here for being able to zoom in uh, panning around on your plot if you make a plot you ought to be able to grab and just if you click on the pan tool see if I have a plot up here If I go uh, plot A versus B. So here I have a plot. Uh, if I click on that, I can move this around. If I click on that, I can zoom in. Um, these are like browser buttons for forward and backwards. This is really nice if you're examining a plot and you're kind of zooming into different regions, you know, I can go back to whatever the zoom level or the, the pan that I had before, so you can move through these. And if you ever get lost, you can always hit the home button and it resets everything so that you're back to the normal display. Um, there's a save button over here that will allow you to save to a lot of different file formats. It defaults to ping, but you have Encapsulated PostScript, SVG, all the kind of standard uh, uh, options there. Um, and then, I can't remember what that was. Oh, this allows you to set up some of the curves, uh, attributes, and figures. So you can set the title and that sort of stuff uh, on the fly instead of having to do it through code. Are you going to cover at some point how to do subplots so you can have two different things? It, that's, uh, yes. We'll go over that a little bit. All right. Uh, uh, let's see what your so when you click on this one that doesn't happen are you in uh, the notebook I don't know Can, uh, can you say that louder in case other people? If you, uh, if you go to, if you're in Anaconda, you go to Tools, Preferences, uh, iPython, Console, uh, the tab for Graphics, and Change, and then you can add that to the library. Okay. All right. Those of you using Spider uh, can You've follow. Been using, you've just been going to the, pro to the process, Alt-Tab, and whatever. That's all I'm doing is, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, you know, the, the way the Canopy works is this is an application and it has kind of a slave Python process. And so you can just tab over and you get those plots up. All right? Okay. So let's run through some of these uh, other plot commands. If I say plot X versus sine of X, and then I put a string after that, like R dash hat, Clearly, this means I want a red line with triangles in it, right? That's <laughs> obvious to everybody here. Uh, and some people are laughing, and other people are like, yeah, that's obvious, because that's what MATLAB does, yeah. right? So uh, this will drive object-oriented programmers batty when they see this sort of stuff. And yet, it doesn't matter uh, how bad it drives them, it's incredibly valuable to have these short format uh, uh, mechanisms to format your line. So here we'll have X versus sine of X and we indeed get a red line and the marker is a hat. And if you want to look at what these options are, you can always do plot question mark. All right, at your command line, either an IPython, well, at an IPython prompt. I'm always gonna be using an IPython prompt on this. And you'll notice down here, they have awesome documentation. And you can see all of the characters and what they mean as far as dashes and, and, and marker types. And then you have the colors, which all make sense, blue, green, red, cyan, all of those make sense until you get to black. And B was already taken, so they instead of using the B, they use the last letter in the, the word, which was K, all right? Uh, and I'll leave it to you to explore all of those options. 
the format, XY format, uh, holds up for doing it with multiple lines. If you give XY in a format, XY in a format, then it will continue to use those as you go through. Hold on is evidently implicit here. Cause That's right. Okay. Hold on is implicit. All right. There's also a command called scatter that will give you a scatter plot, X versus Y. And uh, those of you who like sp uh, uh, sparseness, I guess, would, would argue that, wait a second, I can use the plot command, and if I just leave out the dash here and I just used a hat, that's a scatter plot, right? I don't have a line in there. That would be the same, and you would be correct. In this specific case, you could do this exact same thing by using plot x versus y comma b zero. And that would give you a blue circle there. On the other hand, scatter has more use than that and it's shown over here. Here we've created four different arrays, x, y, size, and color, and they're all random arrays from uh, the random number generator. And it'll generate values between zero and one and then we're going to call scatter and we give it the normal x and y but then we can give size and color as the other two attributes so if you're trying to build something uh, or a plot that that has kind of a pseudo 3d or pseudo 4d you can map multiple attributes to to these values uh, so you have x and y position size and color and, and you'll end up with a plot like this and we've called color bar here at the end and that's going to give you a color bar that tells you how these colors vary, all right, and display it on the plot. Cool? Uh, if you want to make multiple figures or, or uh, on not, not in the same window but have separate windows that are open, uh, then you can call the figure command. And what that will do is when you start call figure, it will pop up a new window for you. And then you start calling any plot command with it after that, and any of your plot commands will work on that specific window, all right? And then if you call figure again, you'll get another window up. Now, these figures have numbers one, two, three, four. So the reality is you can also come back in here and say figure and pass in an argument like one or two or whatever it may be. And if that window is up, that will become the active window instead of creating a new one. All right. Subplot. So it's often desired to be able to put a couple of plots on the same uh, uh, display in the same window. And this again works, uh, this API comes from the MATLAB world. And what we're saying here is if I say subplot two comma one comma one, saying I want a plot area that has two rows, row one, row two, has one column, single column here, and I wanna activate the first plot, which is this one. And then any plot command that I call will operate on this plot. And now I can call subplot again with exactly the same first two arguments, two rows, one column, but activate the second plot, which is this one. And now any plot command I execute will operate there. Okay. Uh, if you end up with this two, this is a very simple one. You can end up with a four by three or whatever. I mean, it can become very large. You know, the number of plots that you might display. Uh, the active plot, that last argument, if it's, uh, it's always going to count across and down. So if you had something, let's say a two by two, it would be one, two, three, four. Okay on which one was the active plot. Multiple plots on a single uh, uh, display or in the same, same plot area, if you just call plot one after another, they're going to plot, uh, be, be plotted automatically in the same plot area. And that's the equivalent from the MATLAB people of hold being on, uh, which is the default. I think this is a difference. MATLAB defaults to hold off, I think. Uh, yeah. so. Um, that's a slight difference. If you don't want uh, the, the old plot to stay uh, there when you plot your new plot, you can say plot sine of x, hold false, and now if you call plot cosine of x, it's going to erase the old plot and just give you the new one. Okay? 
Um, hold false, by the way, only has to be called once on a figure. From then on, it's not going to have hold on. If you want to turn it back on, you're going to have to call hold true. Legends, this is a slick behavior in Python. Uh, you can, because Python supports keyword arguments, whenever you make a plot command, you can immediately assign a label to that plot. And so label sign, label cosine, call legend here, and you get a legend up in the corner. And there are other arguments you can look at. If you do legend question mark, you can see all the arguments, but you can control if it's in the upper right, upper left, lower left, and that sort of thing. And you can also position it specifically some location if you want to, okay? And the legend's gonna use whatever labels you provided. You can also use the MATLAB syntax, and that is you plot two things, and then you have to remember the order of them and say give the labels down here. The real win on being able to label things like this is um, if you have 10 lines that you're plotting on a plot, but you only want two to be labeled, if you only put label equal on two of them, call legend at the end, all 10 lines get plotted, but only two get labels. That's very handy. Uh, titles, <clears throat> X label, that's going to give you the label radians down here, Y label. Uh, here is amplitude. You can set the font size. It used to have to be a word. I think that's changed lately, and lately maybe within the last two years. I don't uh, uh, remember when that changed, but it used to be like small, medium, large, extra large, but I think you can put a font size like 14 in there as well now, okay? And then title, we'll put a title over the entire plot. Grid, great command for just turning on or off the grid. It's, it's a modal. If you call grid while the grid's on, it'll turn off. If you turn it, call it when it's off, it'll turn on. Here, excuse me. Um, if you have a figure up and you want to erase everything in it, on it, call clear figure. Uh, if you want to close the currently open plotting window, call close. If you want to close all of the open plotting windows, I do this a lot if I've gone through, sometimes I'll make a script and I'll say for alpha equals zero to one and I'll sweep through a set of parameters and I'll build a plot for each one of those and just cycle through and look at them, which is really nice. The only problem is you end up with your screen littered with all these windows very quickly. And so close all is a really nice way of just getting rid of all of those with one command, okay? Uh, image display. <clears throat> There's the famous Lena image in, in SciPy, so we'll just grab that out of there. Uh, and this will give us a 2D array. You can call IM show on that. Extent is going to say the, what you want the minimum and maximum X values to be, minimum and maximum Y values. That's basically a mapping. You know, the image is going to be 0 to 256, 0 to 256, or something like that. This is remapping those endpoints uh, to other values. And then you can change the color map. And this is a really handy library to know about the CM library. And it'll come in um, uh, from, from, I think, uh, from matplotlib.pyplot. Import CM, probably. So that's where it's going to come from. <laughs> And the cool thing about CM is it has uh, a veritable cornucopia of color maps for you to choose from. <clears throat> and you just have to look at them all. In fact, there's one of the great uh, images in the gallery, I think, is a picture of all of the color maps that's available. So if you scroll way back up here. There's uh, the color map reference here. And you can poke through these images and, and find a color map that suits your taste uh, and probably annoys your neighbor uh, and, and use that one as, as uh, the color map for your code. All right. And again, color bar at the end will give you a, a, a nice color bar on, on the right-hand side. And you can control if that's vertical or horizontal and that sort of thing. 
the bone color map is, is used in medical imaging a whole lot. It's like a grayscale image, but it has a little bit of a blue hint to it. Plotting from a script, everything that I've shown so far is as if you're typing at a command line. All the plot commands are going to execute immediately. It works just fine from a script as well. The one thing is, if you type this from the command line, all of your plots are showing up as soon as you type them. If you do them from a script, you have to have this show command at the very end. If you don't have that, your plots won't come up. And invariably, that's a problem that people run into. Okay? Histograms, um, uh, you can control how many bins you have in those. Uh, there's error bars. I'm just going to kind of show these right quick. Box plots. And then there's also 3D surface plots. And I always, this is one of the places where I always have to go back to the examples uh, to figure out how to set up my axes to get a 3D projection and all that sort of thing. So this is an example. The thing I like about Matplotlib's 3D visualization is uh, out of the box it looks really good. It's nice looking. Um, and also it's included with Matplotlib. So, so if you have that installed, then you have it there. The downside of it is if you have a lot of data, it's not going to perform very well. Okay? So you'll run into those limitations, and I'm not sure where you'll run into it. We could play with it here, but you're probably going to run into limitations at not that many points, like thousands of points kind of scale on things. If you do that, then you can use, um, uh, there's a library called Mayavi that has, uh, it sits on top of another library called VTK, which is a high-performance 3D visualization data library, uh, visualization library for, for scientific data. And so uh, Mayavi has a nice command line set of tools called MLab, and you can do the same sorts of plots that you might do here. Uh, they look uh, a little bit different, but they, you have a really nice commands for interacting with that data. And the nice thing here is uh, you can scale up to many more data points when you're using this library. You'll still run into limitations, and you'll have to, the deal is to get the high performance, you have to know how to twiddle all the bits, right? Uh, but uh, if you're doing like a scatter plot with just points, you can scale up to millions, and it will work just fine. Okay? All right. Uh, a lot more details you can go over in Matplotlib. What we're going to do right quick is an example. And you know what? What I'm going to encourage you to do is, uh, is to pair program with your neighbor uh, if, um, uh, if, if you don't mind. If you can find somebody to team up with, there are two things that happen with that. The people that are really knowledgeable can help somebody that's not quite as knowledgeable. Uh, and somebody that's, that's new, uh, it, will, it, it will speed them up uh, in the examples. So uh, the way that we typically do that when we're in a class is the person that's, uh, that's newer to, to Python is the typer uh, instead of the other way around, all right? So if you don't mind, see if you can find somebody that's a neighbor. You don't have to, but it, it's helpful uh, if you do that, okay? And you can now have an argument about who's less, uh, or who's going to type. All right, does everybody have a partner? You have the, does everybody have the exercise uh, directory from the website? Everybody have that? There's going to be an exercise, or there's a directory in there called plotting. And if you go into plotting, there will be a plotting.py uh, uh, module in there, or script in there. And it has a lot of instructions. And if you look through them, you're going to start down here. And this should run. You can hit Command-R. And that should run and give you a plot straight away. Uh, uh, oh, it doesn't give you a plot straight away. It just gives you data. And right quickly, I'll give you one other hint. Once you've run something in IPython, doesn't matter which version you're in, all of the variables here are available at the command line. So that I could say, you know, x is there, 
S is there, C is there, and IMG are all there. So I can immediately, after I've run this, if you go up here, run this, then down here at the command line, you ought to be able to say plot X versus S. And you'll get a plot that is X versus S. So that's a one way to start off is run this thing and then start playing at the command line. But your goal is going to be, I'm just going to go and get the, uh, unbeknownst to you, there's also, don't tell anybody, a file named plotting solution in the same directory. You can't look at that yet, all right? But if you run that one, you'll get a plot that looks like this. So your goal is to recreate that plot, okay? Now, there are a few commands that we uh, uh, did not get um, covered uh, on this, and one that I'd like you to type axis question mark that's really useful. Axis uh, is a command for controlling your X and Y range on a plot. Uh, you can either specify the X min, X max, and Y min, Y max uh, specifically, or there are all of these different uh, string commands you can pass in, like equal or scaled, or here's the magic one we like to know about here called tight that will limit it to only plotting the endpoints of what your data is instead of trying to automatically find something that's more human readable. And then the other one to know about is tight layout. And you won't run into that until you notice that your amplitude is overlaying the side of this plot. So uh, you can look at tight layout question mark uh, and get uh, some help there. So we will take, how long? It's 8.53. Let's take 15 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes uh, on this. Uh, and I'll be walking around the room. Uh, this is a big crowd, so I bet that there are four or five of you that are really versed in this. There may be even a lot more than that. I would ask your help, I guess. If you get done with this, like in 30 seconds, then look around if there are people in your area that are struggling to see if you can help them out, okay? But I'm going to be walking around, too. I'll give you about five minutes to get, get your bearings and try it out, and then I'll start asking if people need help. How was that? Is everybody getting the hang of things? I notice there's a lot of just getting familiar with the environment and that sort of thing, which is great. Um, let's just walk through this right quick. So the solution here, and we had our one, two, three. These were our exercises. Make a blue line and a cosine with a red plus marker and so on. And we started here. Um, with the data set. We had all of these imports that are always great hints at the top. They tell you what functions you're likely to need to use in an exercise. We started out by already providing you the data. We read in the X, created, a, or created an X sine and cosine, read in an image. This close all, I got a few questions around that. The only reason I have that in there is a lot of times when you're running a script over and over again, you end up over plotting something that was old. And if you put a close all at the front, that's one way of making sure that you get rid of the plots that are on the screen and you just get up the plots. You always get a fresh plot, basically, okay? You don't have to have this in here at all. That's not a required thing. It's just uh, can be handy sometimes. And then we want a two by two layout. So when we call subplot, we say, okay, I want two rows, two columns, and I want to activate the first plot. And the first plot, if our, if our plots look like this, <coughs> this is going to be one, two, three, and four. So we're activating this guy. <coughs> and I want to plot x versus sine of x, which was our, uh, our s variable up here. And I want to do that with a blue line. So a dash is just a solid line. And then I want to plot x versus cosine of x with a red plus. And this is one of the commands that you had to look up on your own. Uh, and that is axis tight. 
and I think, it, is it tight in MATLAB or FIT, maybe? I can't remember what it is, but it's something like that. Um, and what that does is, if you don't use this, let's just do, uh, let's close that. If I just come in and I do this, and run that snippet of code, I get a plot that looks like this. And notice, I have a big gap over here, right? So if I come in and I run that line, I can just do that with Command Shift R, then that forces it to be a tight layout where it doesn't leave a gap around it. The gap is there to try to make it kind of nice tick marks, right? A human readable, normal kind of values, but sometimes you want to fit it directly to your data. So that's what the tight does. The second uh, set of commands here is to give us uh, that second plot, and it's very similar. We're just doing subplot two, second row, or two rows, two columns, so it's the same layout as before, and I want to activate two. And then we're going to plot X versus S, set up a grid, do X label, Y label, and title on this, and then again make that a tight layout. So I'll just highlight that, hit uh, uh, Command Shift R, and we ought to get our second plot up here, okay? And notice we, we have a little bit of a problem, and that is that I have amplitude overlapping. And so one way to fix that is just make your window bigger. <laughs> Does that not, doesn't make anybody feel that good? All right, so maybe that's not the right way to do it. All right, we'll look at a little better way to do that in a minute. And then the third thing that we're gonna do here is <clears throat> we have a third plot and an image, or we're gonna do an image display. And I wanna have that instead of this image, let's just go and look at the size. We haven't actually image that shape. So this is a weird shaped image, 461 by 615. <laughs> but what we wanna do is instead of having that from zero to 461 and zero to 615, we want to say that that's a negative 10 to 10 on the x-axis, a negative 10 to 10 on the y-axis. So that's what the extent keyword is. And then the last cmap.cm.winter, you can make that, you know, we could make that copper or whatever we wanted. So I could come in here and you can always see cm. You can get a whole lot of help on these. And the ocean, that sounds like a good one. Let's do ocean. I don't know what ocean looks like. So now I'll just take those commands and we'll run those. And there's my plot. All right. So that's the ocean color map that's displayed there. You might have winter or something else. And the last command here is the one that fixes. So we currently have this overlap. If I run that, it goes through all the plots and looks at how they're laid out, and whenever it finds two that are gonna be overlapping, it tries to relay out in a better way. So it tries to compact everything as well as it can, but based on not overlapping things, okay? And then this save fig, that's a nice command at the very end that will save it out to uh, a, uh, a ping image, and if you click on that ping, it just opens up here, all right? <coughs> Any questions there? Yeah. Could you elaborate on the share feature a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, that's sort of an advanced kind of feature, but uh, let me just look at it here. Let me go to the bonus solution. So his question was, can you comment on the sharing of two axes? Um, and the deal here is whenever you create a subplot, let's just go back. Oh, here, I can do it down here. So if I say, if I say um, subplot two comma two comma one and ask for the axis back, it gives me this thing called an axis object. It's actually a subplot axis, axis subplot object. And <clears throat> Axes objects in matplotlib are what control, they're basically the area that you're plotting in or the, the layout of that area. 
uh, and, and it's the X and the Y axes kind of pieces of that. So when you get one back, you can actually, every time you call subplot, it gives you a new axis back. And typically they all are independent of one another. And so let's just go and run this. If I go and I pan around here, I'm panning each of these plots independently of one another, right? But if I go in and instead go and say, I want to get the axis area for the first plot area back. And then when I create my second subplot area, I want it to share axes with one. And we're telling it to share both the X and the Y. If I go and run this and get this plot up, if I go and start panning this around, both plots are panning. If I go and zoom on one, then both of them zoom. That's a quite handy feature, right, on things. So that's what that's about. All right, other questions? All right. Enough about Matplotlib. And back to the hero of our story, NumPy arrays. So we're gonna start going through and talking about an array structure, uh, uh, the array structure itself. And I would uh, encourage you, I will be moving fairly quickly here, but feel free to type along uh, with what we're doing. So you create an array uh, by, by casting some kind of list or, or, or sequence to an array object. Here we get A, we see that it is in Z, 0, 1, 2, 3. And you can ask for the type of that array. And when you say type of A, this is what is the Python data type that this array is, A. And it'll tell you, well, it's a NumPy ND array. All right, so that's, you remember we talked about it being an ND array, even though we call it array all the time. That's actually the least or the less interesting kind of data type to know about. The other one to look at is asking a dot, so we're looking at an attribute on the array. What is your data type? What is the type of every element in an array? So you remember with the, num or with the Python list, you often have a heterogeneous list of things. You can have strings and integers and all sorts of things. In NumPy arrays, you can actually do that, but the more typical case is to have an array of all the same data type. Everything in your array is the same type of number, like an int 32 or an int 64 or a float 32 or float 64. And there's a wide range of numbers that it can handle uh, from, from kind of Boolean values uh, up to, to, you know, a complex number with um, a double complex number with um, 128 bytes that are rep or, or bits that are representing it. So here we're looking and it tells us the d-type for this is int 32. That means that every element in this array is a four byte integer. And if you ask for a dot item size, that will tell you how much memory does each item take up. And it takes up four element, or four bytes. You can also ask for the shape of an array by saying a dot shape, or there's also a function called shape that you can use. Historically, we just had the function shape. All these attributes were added uh, as NumPy uh, was built. And so a.shape is a really handy way of asking for what is the shape of this array. And you'll notice it doesn't just return, well, it has four elements. It actually returns, what's the data type it's returning there? Anybody know? It's a tuple, that's right. Shape always returns a tuple, and this tuple, in this case, is a, has one entry in it, and that is the, the number of elements it has along the first dimension. The first dimension here is that has four elements, so you ha have an entry that's four here. If we had made an array that was two-dimensional, that was four by four, or four by eight, or whatever it may be, then this would return four comma eight. If I get a four L, is that a long integer? That is, that's right, the L means long. Um, what OS are you on? Uh, eight, Windows 8.1. Okay. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I haven't run into that. Uh, typically, 
Okay. I'd have to think about that a little yeah, bit. Windows 10 does the same thing, so it must be something that's a later Windows. Because I did before that one. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, Windows is a little bit different when they went to a 64 bit operating system in that integer did not change. Int is 32 bit instead of 64 bit. Well, it may. I mean, there's a lot of details under the covers that can percolate up. I'm guessing that that little, di that's the difference here, is that the underlying NumPy code did not change uh, that from being an int32 to being a 64. And so to be able to manage much larger arrays, it would have to have that value. That's why you have that. Or that's my guess at why that's the case. Uh, a dot size, that returns to you the total number of elements within the array. So in this case, it's very trivial, it's just four, but if this were a four by eight array, then this number would be 32, all right? <coughs> and then in bytes, this tells you the size of, uh, of memory that is taken up by the, um, the data in your array. Now the, the, the array itself is gonna take up a little more memory than this because it has information to keep track of what's my size and what's my data type and all of this information. That's not included in this number. This number is only about the size of your uh, memory taken up by the data in your array. So if you have an N32, which is four bytes, you have four elements, four times four is 16. That's where this in bytes comes to 16. Okay, and we have a one-dimensional array here. If you wanna access elements in an array, it's, it's very standard, zero-based indexing that you're used to in Python. A0 will give you an element back. If you ask for A bracket zero and set that to 10, then that overwrites the element and you're writing a value in. <clears throat> there are a couple of ways if you want to overwrite everything with a single value. A.fill0 will fill everything in an array with zero. You can also do that with this command, and uh, we're about to see how indexing works. But what this is saying is I want, it's like indexing up here, but instead of indexing a single element, it's indexing a slice. Because we've omitted the beginning and end index that says go from the beginning to the end, and we're assigning the value one into those. If that makes no sense whatsoever, we'll cover it in a minute, all right? Um, you do need to be aware, this used to be a much bigger issue than it is now, but just be aware of this. If you have a data type that's in 32 for your array, and then you come along and try to assign in a floating point number, A0 is 10.6, this array is in 32, and I've just put in something that's not an in 32. NumPy will silently convert whatever you pass in to the data type that you have. And so in the case of a floating point number, it silently truncates it and it will get rid of any decimal part and you end up with 10, 1, 2, 3. All right? Uh, all right. Slicing, it didn't take us long to get there, right? So slicing is a really big deal uh, it's a fun thing in Python with list. Uh, for, for NumPy, it's an essential thing to understand. So you, you need to have a good grasp of this. It's how we do all of our math or how we do all of our looping, and it turns out. So let's look at this. We have A here. Um, nobody has a pointer, do they? Does anybody have a laser pointer? Come on, guys. <laughs> 60 geeks, one room, no laser pointer. I wasn't gonna get you guys are about to lose your card. You're, you're gonna lose your geek card. Uh, all right, no pointers. Uh, and I can't really wander around that well, so, or the video, or the audio won't work. So let's look at this. If I have an array here, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, that I've created, when we use zero-based indexing, one way of thinking about this is the zero, and I like to think about it this way for slicing, uh, is the zero is the, the indices are between the elements. So the zeroth element is going to get the one right after that. And the way that this is nice is if I say I want to go and slice out one colon three, it says start at index one and go up to index three. 
And what that will do is it slices out everything in between those and gives it back to you, all right? Which is 11 and 12. Now, it, what's that? So, so that's the way of, uh, so that's why it's nice to have the picture drawn this way. If you think about these as in between the elements, then what you end up with is it's going to give you everything between one and three. Now that's one way of thinking about it. And that's the way that I've, I've learned to think about things in my head. The other way of thinking about this is that it's uh, inclusive on the lower end and exclusive on the upper end. All right. That's the other way to think about things. Whichever one fits your brain better is fine. Uh, it's just that those are the rules. And there's a long kind of explanation. In fact, we have a video in our training about this talking about why did they do it this way. There's a guy named Dykstra here uh, that, that at, U, at UT, I guess he's still here, uh, that, that um, uh, is famous in computer science, and he has an argument about why this is the right way to do indexing. In the end, his last line, I think, in his paper talks about beauty, though. So it's not exactly a mathematical proof, I would, uh, I would say. Uh, but there are some good arguments for doing things this way. We're not going to go into them. We'll just use this as how it's done. So we're going to go from 1 to 3, slice that out, and we get 11 and 12. A slick thing about Python is you can use negative indexing, right? So if I want to do 1 colon negative 2, that's going to go and give me, we can start at 1, and then negative 1, negative 2 counts from the back of the array. That's how negative values work in, in indexing for Python. So that will be right here. So we'll go from 1 to negative 2, and that slices out the same area. If we did negative 4, we go negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. Well, that's the same as starting at 1 and going up to 3. So all of these are alternative ways of writing exactly the same thing. Just for the record, mm -hmm. Dijkstra died in 2002. 2002. So it, uh, his, you can look at it. He has a lot of handwritten notes, and this is one of those. So I'm 13 years late on, on uh him being here. A lot of cool stuff that he's done. But he, was here at UT. Yeah. he was here at UT, that's right. From 84 to 2000. All right, so how about omitting indices? Here we're going A and I have colon 3. And what I've done is I've omitted the first index. And I'm going uh, the start index. And I'm saying index 3 is the last index. Well, when you omit an index, that means start at the beginning. So here we're going to go up, starting at the beginning and stopping at 3. So that will give us the first three elements. 10, 11, 12 will come back. How about if you wanted to grab the last two elements? Well, you can do that by starting at negative 2. And then if you omit the last index, that will go to the end. Really handy capability here. So negative 1, negative 2. All right? And then this last one, we're omitting the beginning and the end index. And we have this other value here, and that's called the step. So this says get every other element. All right, so we start at the beginning, go to the end, but get every other. So this will give you the even elements. Just as a, as a quick check, how would I get the odd? This is not giving, this is even indexed elements, right? This is not just pulling out the even values in the array. It's the ones that are on the 0, 2, 4, 6 indices. How would I get the uh, odd indexed elements? Start at 1. That's exactly right. So I would put a 1 right here, colon, go to the end, and step every other value. So just to finish that out. the odd indices. Okay? All right, so let's see. Is this the place to do? It is, I think. What time is it? All right, so let's do an exercise here called calc derivative. And I'm not sure what to do with the microphone here because I'm going to go to the board. 
wonder if this will work. All right. Real, real quick, how do we how do we clear what's in the um, interactive part? Clear. Oh, well, that's too hard. So you should be able to type clear, and that'll work. Thank you. How's the sound back there? Huh? Is it okay? Okay. Sorry, I was talking to the sound guy, so that he. Okay, so the exercise we're going to do here is called calc derivative. And your job here is you're going to be given a set of data, uh, of discrete data and arrays, and your job is to calculate the derivative of those values. So let's draw a picture here. Can I get rid of this? Is that OK? So let's take a data set that you might have, and we'll do, um, all right, x equal, and let's just say we start, x starts at 0, and it goes to 1, 1.5, and 3, or something like that, OK? And then I have y, and y is going to go from um, say start at one, it'll go up to two, go to three, and then back to one, something like that. So if I go and plot these, then we're going to start at 0 here. We go out to 1. We have a value of 1.5, uh, and then 2, and then 3. And then we have y was at 1, 2, and 3. So if I go and plot these values, I'm going to start. 0, 1 is going to be uh, the x value is here, and then I have a y value there. Let's go ahead. And then if I plot 1, 2, then I come here, and I'm going to have a value there. And then 1.5 and 3, I'm here. And then I go way out to 3, and I have a value at 1. Did I do all that right? Does that look good? <clears throat> OK, so we can look at this, and we have a line here that is our discrete data that we've measured here. And your job is going to be a calculating the derivative for at each of these points, right? Now that's with this, anytime you have discrete da data, you have questions about how you're calculating that derivative. We're just going to think about this as a simple uh, derivative. If you, uh, if you want to calculate the derivative, let's say at this point, then you're going to look at the line here, this line, and you're going to want to get the derivative of that line. So if this is line 1, and this was x0, y0, right? And this is x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3. Now, somebody help me out. When I would say I want to calculate the derivative, or I'll name that slope here. How do I do that? What is that calculation? Or, or, or difference in the y's over the difference in the x's. Exactly. So you have your rise or your difference in your y's, dy, and your difference over your difference in the x's. Sir? Yes? That's not entirely true. You can take a limit in some sense. Well, when you have discrete data, <coughs> like we have a discrete set of data, and so everything about this is going to be an approximation. Okay. Um, if it, what you, but the the what the um, the graph that connects the data is this continuous line, so it is possible to take a limit as delta x goes to zero because even though those points are discrete, the lines connecting them are continuous. 
you, it's yeah so you could have a, an assumption of is this linear here or do you yeah. have some kind of um, well, if, if you assumed it's linear in between, do you really have to take a limit? I, the, but uh, no. I don't know that that would. The, the derivative is the slope of that line segment. So okay. You know. Okay. So, so uh, I'm not a math major. I'm an engineer, which puts me in a way lower category. I know. Um, <laughs> but, Thank you. I was just about to say that, but I didn't want to be rude. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's a rough crowd today, isn't it? Man. I'm just kidding. No, I know. Uh, but so from this, what we're going to look at is really trying to look at this discrete data and just calculate that derivative on it. And so uh, I'll say we're assuming it's linear in between uh, in this case. All right? Uh, so if we look at this and we have dy over dx, now I'm going to simplify right now and let's just think about or I'm going to call this zero, actually, the zeroth line. And we'll call the dy zero and dx zero. Now, if I just go through and I want to calculate the dy zero value, how do I do that? So I'm just doing this piece. How would I do that? Subtract y1 minus y zero. y1 minus y zero. Perfect. I'm going to be pedantic here. And we're going to finish this out because we have a 1 and then we have a 2, right? We have all of these lines here. So if I do dy1, that's going to be? y2 minus y1. Awesome. And the final one is going to be y3 minus y2, right? Now, if we do this in a normal programming kind of sense, we write a loop to go through these, right? Well, one of the things that you'll notice here is, look at this. <coughs> All of those values are right next to each other if we look at this, right? Y. Y, one, two, three. And all of these values are right next to each other. So you can kind of think about these as the Y, uh, well, wrong color. These are the Y uppers and these are the Y lowers. We're subtracting the lower point from the upper points, right? And let's look at this. If we go over here to y, look at this grouping right here. Those are the y uppers, right? Sure. And look at this grouping right here. Those are the y lowers, um, right? Did I do that? I did that wrong. Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to hear the uhs in the crowd and make sure you're not asleep. There's the y lowers and the y uppers. Does that make sense? The other one shouldn't have. This one should, right? <clears throat> okay, so okay. now we have a setup where, look, this is three elements and this is three elements. They're both the same size. If I just subtracted one from the other, we're actually calculating the dy's for all of these all at once. That's the magic here. This is called vector math on these guys. So the way that you would write this is, if I want to do dy, how would I do this if I'm writing this as a math plot li or a, a, a NumPy expression? I have y, and I want to get the y uppers because that's the first group. So how would I write that? One colon. Cool? So I'm starting at one, going to the end. Minus. How would I write the y lowers? I heard it out there at least once. Colon minus one. That's even better. Because you're going back here. Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. You go back minus one. And now I have an expression to calculate dy. And what's awesome about that? is it doesn't matter if I have four points or four billion points, this expression works, all right? So by doing it this way, you have expressed your, at least part of your derivative, just the dy part, with, um, with uh, a single vector expression. Now the other important thing about this is 
You remember we talked about, uh, or maybe I guess we didn't talk about a whole lot at the beginning. If you write in Python, if you write things in, uh, if you write things in um, for loops, I'm going to end up with blue fingers if I don't put a cap on this. If you write thing in, things in for loops in Python, then it's going to be uh, horribly slow, right? If you try to calculate this derivative the same way that you would in C, where you write a for loop, do the same thing in Python, you're going to be a factor of 50 to 100, maybe 200 times slower than if you wrote it in C. And you'll hear people say Python's a lot slower than C, and that's what they're talking about, all right? However, if you write an expression like this, what happens is we have written a single Python line that uh, drops down into C and runs the for loop down in C that does the subtraction. That's managed by the thing called the ufunks that I was talking about before. And by doing that, this loop actually happens in C. It's not quite as optimal always as the C that you can write by hand. So on this, you might be paying for this specific command. You might pay somewhere between one. It might be just as fast as C. It might be a factor of you know, one and a half to three times slower. But it's not near the penalty that you'll pay in general. And it's very fast to write and pretty understandable. So it's a great way of being able to write things in Python. Now, <clears throat> what your job is going to be is we've done it for dy. I need you to calculate the slope, dy over dx. So you're going to have to do a little bit more work. And then what I want you to do is plot it in our exercise. Carry my microphone back. In our exercise here, we're going to start with a sign of x, right, and plot x versus y. And what I want you to do is calculate the derivative of this at every one of the points along here. Uh, and uh, it should look suspiciously like cosine, right? So what I'd also like you to do is compare that to cosine uh, and see how close you get. All right? Make a plot of that. And for those of you that solved this problem, oh, one more comment on it. But if, for those of you who solved this problem in 30 seconds, which there will be a number of you because you've done it a thousand times in MATLAB before, then uh, you can um, uh, try the, the problem by, but instead of, of calculating derivatives, let's calculate the integral at every point using something like Riemann sum or a trapezoidal rule type uh, calculation. And to do that, <clears throat> there's this function called cum sum that's very handy to know about. All right, so do cum sum question mark and get that. The one comment that I'll make about plotting, uh, you remember we're going to compare this to cosine. If I look at this data up here, if I calculate the derivative of this line right here, where is it located? Is this the derivative at this point? or at this point? You can make an argument that it's at either one of those, but what would be a better location? Midpoint. The midpoint, all right? So, uh, you know, you have the upwind approximation, downwind approximation, or the central approximation. Central approximation makes a little more sense uh, on this, so you could choose to plot it there when you're comparing to cosine, and that ought to be, give you a better accuracy on the overlay of your two plots. Now, the thing you'll notice is, how many data points do I have here? Four. How many lines do I have? Three. Three. So when I calculate this derivative, I'm only going to have three data points instead of four. So anytime you take a derivative, you're at one less point than you were from your original data set. All right? With that being the case, you're going to have to do a little bit of jiggering when you do the plot. You can't just plot your original x versus the derivative that you calculate because it's going to have one less point. You're either going to have to cut one point off of that or you're going to have to do a calculation to find the center point of each of those lines and plot against that. Does that make sense? To do that, what I'm talking about is you're going to have to calculate what is this x value, what is that x value, wherever it falls, 
and what is this x value? And then when you calculate your slope, if these are your, you know, we'll call that x2 or whatever, or x centers, you're going to want to plot x centers versus your slope instead of plotting your slope against your original x. Is that clear as mud? All right. Let's have at it. And if you're successful, you will earn a coffee break. <laughs> All right? All right, let's work at this for a little bit. Let's look at this. All right, so we started with x and y. We wanted to calculate a dy and a dx so that we could get our slope. We worked out on the board the dy formula. The dx looks stunningly similar, right? So uh, it's shifted the same way. We subtract those two, we get our dx, and now we can do dy divided by dx. These are each three elements. When you divide them, it does an element by element division, and you get dy dx. And then we talked about where are we going to plot these values, where are they located. So the calculation that I'm doing here is if I want to find these midpoints, I have x0 and y, uh, x1. To find this center point, I just add x0 to x1 and divide by 2. It's basically averaging all the x values, right? Or the neighboring x values. Well, that looks very much like our D, dy and dx calculation here. The only difference is instead of subtracting them, we're adding neighbors and dividing by 2. So that will give you the average value. And so now this has 100 points in it, and this one does as well. And so we can go and plot our center to x versus dy dx, and we can plot center x versus cosine of that center's x. And then we can give a title here. Uh, and you'll notice the title looks uh, quite complicated. Anybody know what we're doing here? Aha. You guys were going to really lose your geek cards if nobody could answer that. So this is a LaTeX. Uh, a command to make a um, a fancier kind of, of title in my page and we'll even see more down here uh, with an integral being displayed so the cool thing here is matplotlib understands LaTeX you just have to put it in between dollar signs and I put an R out here in the front and the R means a raw string uh, that's from the Python side of thing you don't have to put that there, but if you don't, you have to put double backslashes everywhere because backslashes are an escape character in a string. If you make a raw string, then the backslashes uh, don't have to be escaped. So we run through this, uh, and let me go up here. We'll grab all of this, run it, and there's my plot. And I have my derivative of sine of x overlays quite nicely uh, with the real calculation, okay? Now, we did the trapezoidal, <clears throat> or here we're gonna do the bonus. Uh, to calculate the, the bonus here, if we're gonna do integration, then what we wanna do is we wanna come through here and basically calculate the area under each one of these strips And to calculate the area, you have dx. Well, we've already calculated that. That's going to be the width. And you also, you could either do a trapezoid here. I mean, you could do some, uh, uh, treat it as a trapezoid. Or you can look at this and go, hey, if I had a square here, this line cuts that square in half. So that's equivalent to something square, if we go just, if we treat the height of this to be the average of these two, then that will be the area under that entire trapezoid, right? 
that's the, the cheat that you have on, on um, uh, trapezoidal rule integration. So here, what you have to do is find the average height, which is just dy1 plus dy0 divided by 2. That will give you that point. You multiply that times dx, and you're going to get the area of this strip. So you can do that for all of those, and you'll get an array with the area of each strip, which is exactly what you got when you were doing things. Now, that just gives you the area of your strip. If you're calculating the integral right here, though, you need to sum up all of these strips, right? That's where the function cum sum comes in. You run cum sum on an array. If I have like an array, one, two, So I have A here, if I, say, if I say sum of A, then that sums up all the values. But if I say cum sum of A, what that does is it starts at the first one and adds it to all the previous elements. Well, that's just one. Then one plus two, and then when we get to the second one, we add it to all the previous elements, and that gives us the result there. That's a three, and then three plus two plus one. So it basically gives you all the intermediates as you go up, all right? And now if we do the cum sum there, we're going to get our, our full Riemann sum. So let's, um, let's close all, and then uh, run that. And you'll get a plot that looks like that. All right? Let's drink some coffee to celebrate. It is 10.23. I'm not going to give you a very long break because I don't want to lose too much time. Let's do, it says 10.20 back there. Let's be back by 10.30. Uh, so, 8 to 10 minutes here. So, I got a question a little earlier that I didn't know the answer to, and that was, what about lunch? What's the plan for that? Is it here or do you go out to the drag? And the answer is you go out to the drag. So everybody's on their own. You can pick whatever you want. I think there's pretty much, you know, pizza and what, pretty much any fast food that you want uh, or don't want. But there's plenty of fast food uh, within probably a two or three block area. You basically walk that way out of the building. Or if you walk that way, you get to uh, a street that Guadalupe is a main drag that kind of cuts like this. And I'm trying to think, is anybody a UT student here? I, to, I, I work a block from here. What are, so what are the choices? Uh, like, I mean, if you go to the Dobie Center, they have pizza, sushi, um, a little burrito shop, and there's five or six places up and down Guadalupe that you can go to that are pretty good. Any recommendations? Just by the name, it sounds like it ought to be pretty good. <laughs> and then there's the sushi place inside the Dobie. I think it's called Boishi Sushi. What is the Dobie? Um, it's the one, I think it's, it's off of Guadalupe. I think it's to west of here, um, just north of MLK. And it, is, is it like an indoor? Yes. So it's like you walk into a big building and yeah, it's then... it's like a mall. You go up the stairs and that's the food court. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, Ty, how are you? Should be paying you commission today, actually, uh, after that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. So, <coughs> let's look at multi dimensional arrays. Everything we've done so far is with a 1D array. By the way, when we go for lunch, are these still locked here at all? Like, do you leave notebooks? Or? I wouldn't leave anything here. Not, uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't leave anything here. Yeah. Um, I'm not leaving my laptop. I don't. I trust all the geeks around, but. Um, it's the other. Huh? It's the other. Yeah, or, or maybe there's a bad geek in the group. I don't know. Uh, no, it's just too much uh, to, to try to monitor. Um, and I think there'll be people actually that don't leave, right? So that there'll probably be people that just hang out and have a carrot cake or whatever and stay here for the hour. So I bet the rooms get used. Um, all right, so multi-dimensional arrays. The way you create a multi-dimensional array is you ha hand in a sequence of sequences. 
right? Or a list of lists is how we've done it here. I have a list, the first element is a list, the second element is a list. So I end up with this nested kind of structure, and if we convert that to an array, this first element, which is a list itself containing four elements, becomes the first row, and this becomes the second row. So you end up with an array that looks like this, and its shape is two by four. And if you ask by, for the number of elements, or if you ask for its size, it's gonna be eight, which is two times four. That's the total number of elements in the array. And how many dimensions does it have? Well, it has two, okay? What about wanting to access an element in the array? So if we look at this, we have rows and columns. We can actually index into this array with a tuple is basically what's happening. One comma three actually makes a tuple, but it, that's, that's kind of an under the covers kind of implementation detail. What it looks like to us is this, the first index and the second index, row and column. So we reach in, index zero, one, and then index zero, one, two, three, that's gonna pull out this 13, all right? If we wanna go and set a value, we just set the value by saying one comma three, and that's equal to negative one, so that'll set the value in. <clears throat> now, one other thing that's interesting, if you, if you index a two-dimensional array, but you only provide one index value, if, if you're a MATLAB person, the way that it does that is it treats your array as if it's a one-dimensional array, and it gives you an element out of it that's like you've kind of pulled the two-dimensional array into one long one and then given you that element out of it. NumPy doesn't do that. It gives you, when you index the index one, what that does is it treats it as basically just supplying the row and getting all the columns. So this is a row index. So we're asking for the zero, <coughs> index zero, index one, we're gonna grab that entire row out. You don't see this a whole lot, but you will see it some, okay? We'll actually see it in, a demo, uh, in an exercise. Not quite like that, but almost. When you index like that, and it brings back a row, it's not making it, is it making it a copy, or is it just referencing what, what I'm using over here? It's gonna be a reference. So indexing in this way, all the things, standard indexing, we'll come to something called fancy indexing in a minute, but all of these standard indexings that are getting a regular block of memory out of, some, out of an array, they're always gonna be references in, so they're not gonna make a copy. So if you set, so if you did A of one like that, and then set one of those elements, it's gonna set it in the original? That's exactly right, that's exactly right. So that's both of, uh, um, an opportunity to shoot yourself in the foot, right? And also an opportunity to provide you real control over your memory so that you don't have this explosion of memory. One of the things that people run into specifically with MATLAB is you're like, holy cow, my, my program, I just ran a few commands and it's huge. Uh, and I don't really have control over when and when it doesn't create new data. By default, it does that to always stay safe, basically. But on the other hand, it can run into memory explosions. NumPy kind of takes the opposite, where it tries to, whenever it can, give you a reference back, and only when you explicitly ask does it make a copy. So you would call dot copy uh, on it. Uh, so there's a method called copy that would force that. There is, you're a good straight man. Oh wait, well, let's go, let's go here and we'll start with this and then I'll go back. I thought it was the next slide, but you were not quite that good of a straight man. If you're a really good straight man, you would have said, so how would I read these in? But you didn't do that, so we'll skip here. <laughs> uh, <coughs> all right, we'll have to work on that better before the, the, the next tutorial. Uh, we'll get it down. All right, so slicing in NumPy. How do you do this with a two-dimensional array? Well, there are a lot of options here. If we look over uh, at our, our commands and our picture here, we have a two-dimensional array. And if I have asked for A0, this is the row, and then I'm giving a full slice for the column. 
So what's going to happen here is I'm going to go index zero row, which is this one, and then start zero, one, two, three, four, five. And it's inclusive on the upper end, exclusive on the, uh, uh, or inclusive on the lower end, exclusive on the upper end. Or you can think about these indexes in between, and it's going to get the pieces in between. You can always also check 5 minus 3, that's 2. That's how many elements you're going to get. So here we're going to get two columns, which are the 3 and 4. And so that's the piece you cut out. If you want to get this lower block down here, then you ask for A, and we're going to have index here 4 to the end. Index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to the end, because I omitted the index, right, on the top end of that slice. And then for the column, I'm providing another slice from 4 to the end. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 from this column over. And that will give me the blue area. Yes? So when you use the slicing, you will get a copy, right? You do not. It's a reference. Okay. Yep. It's exactly right. So, um, so we're getting references each time, and I think, see, you guys are just a little early. If I need you guys, we've got to work on our timing, guys, and, and it would be perfect. Uh, as it is, imagine, for example, you wanted to get a column. Some people might want to do that, right? Who might that be? All right, the way you would do that here is my row, I'm going to start and get the beginning to the end of rows. So I'm going to start here and go all the way down. But here I want the index 0, 1, 2 column. So 0, 1, 2, it's this column. And I'm going to pull all those values out. So it's not quite as simplistic as being able to pull out the first row. You have to provide, I want the uh, beginning to the end of the column and get the, uh, and comma two to get the, the, which column it is. But that's how you would do it, all right? Question. Yes? So if you pull out a, a column like this, say if I were to set that equal to some variable, could I then operate it to operate it on the index and then get the column that I'm Or an array. So lists are very different things, right, than an array. Yeah, so let me just see if I can. So let me make an A range here, 25. So here's a long array, or let's do 20. And I'm going to do some shenanigans here where I just change its shape. All right? So you can assign to the shape the, the thing you have to do there. And in fact, if I just start with this, if I just wanted to have five columns, or five rows, I mean, I can put negative one there, and it'll actually calculate how many columns it should have. Now, this only works, so if I look at A, it's the same thing I had before. You have to have it the right size. I can't just give any arbitrary sizing here. I specifically said A range 20 and then did something that was 5 by 4. If I did 3 by 7, it's going to break, all right? But we have that. Now, if I say B is equal to A, and let's get the index 2 column out of this. So the, that's these guys right here. Now, there was one question. What happens if I set one of those values? So I've affected B. Let's go look at A. A got affected as well because B is a reference into A, all right? Now, if I have B, what's its data type? It's an N64. Now, I can go and take B to the second power or whatever I want to do. I can do B plus B. I can do B plus uh, 10. I can do sine of B. You know, I can do all of these operations. Uh, and you're not going to run into a type issue specifically. But I couldn't go in, for example, on B, if I go in and try to set the zeroth value here equal to 100.3, right? It's going to truncate that just like we were talking about before. And A, of course, is going to get that 100 as well. 
Now, if you want to make B independent, I'll make BB, B.copy. Then now this is a copy, and if I go and set the zeroth value to 10,000, BB is modified, but B is not, and neither is A. All right? So that's how you would explicitly copy something. All right. Last one here. This last one is a, a bit quirky, but uh, it's, it's a good illustration. Here we're trying to pull a checkerboarded pattern out of this data set. And here we're saying I want to go to, start at two, index go to the end, and step by two. So we're going to start at index zero, one, two. Then we're going to go to the end, stepping every other element. All right? And the rows, we're going to start at the beginning, go to the end, and get every other element. So, I mean, column, excuse me. So in columns, we start at this column. That's the first one. We're going to go to the very end and get every other one. All right? And that pulls out that checkerboard pattern. Very slick that way. Now, as we mentioned, slices are references, and we've pretty much gone over this, so no need to, to look at that slide. Okay, instead of doing an exercise, we didn't put the filter image in. It's, it would take too long, I think, anyways, but I want to draw this on the board. I think if, if you get the way that we did the derivative, and you get the way we're doing this, you really have kind of, that's kind of level one NumPy, or maybe even a little higher. I mean, that's uh, where maybe there are three or four levels. Like, it gets you a long, long way if you get to where you're not writing for loops, and you start looking at problems as, how do I decompose this as a vector? And how do I do these operations in vectors? That's really the key uh, to, to becoming effective with this. So. With that in mind, let's just draw on the board a handy dandy microphone. <coughs> so we'll look at a, a an image processing example. Imagine you have an image and these are our pixels of the image, right? And somebody gives you the task of, listen, I would like you to process this with a smoothing filter. A common way of doing that is if you have a pixel here, then one simple smoothing filter is to take the neighbors of this pixel in the vertical and horizontal directions and add those to it and divide by five. So you're basically just taking all of your neighbors and averaging them and replacing this pixel with that. All right. Now I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Well, let's look at one thing. Now, if, if we add this stencil that we're executing, we're trying to do for every pixel, a typical situation is you would loop through and execute this for every pixel. Now, what would I do here? It's kind of hard to figure out, right? There's a lot of options of what you could do, but we don't have a neighbor here and I don't have a neighbor here. So instead of trying to think about periodic boundary conditions or anything else, we'll just do the easy thing and ignore those pixels. All right? So I'm going to uh, be an engineer again and cheat and just do it for these center pixels. All right? And the second thing that I'm going to do, just so that we can ease our uh, kind of drawing, uh, how difficult it is to draw this, I'm going to actually think about having a stencil that looks like this. So imagine you're just going to average with your neighbor above you. Okay? All right, so that's our problem set. We're not going to average with everybody, just the pixel above us. So, <coughs> actually, let me draw this. 
with my blue instead of my black. So if I call this whole thing, this array is just called image. All right, so we're thinking about every one of these. We're gonna have a four by four array that's representing this image. We'll call it IMG. And if I wanted to pick out these blue pixels, these are this set of pixels, right? And if I look at this, If I want to get the pixel above that, that's this pixel, right? If I look at this one, that's this pixel. If I look at the one above this, that's this pixel. If I look at the one above this, that's this pixel. So we have the same kind of patterning that we were looking at before. These things are all actually clustered together in one area. So if I call this blue, I'll call this IMG, um, or maybe I'll do it over here so I have more room. We'll call that IMG center. And then we have this red one. And we'll call that IMG upper. All right, does that all make sense? Now we can think about this. If I pull this image out and kind of lay it on its side, and I pull that image out and lay it on its side, then this pixel is now above this pixel is now above the pixel that it needed. That pixel is above that one, so on. So we can just add down. And we're going to end up with, in the end, make a green image. We're going to end up with each of these pixels coming through. And we could take an add operation. And so this would be the image, uh, I'll call it image A for image added of these two. And if you took that and divided that by two, we would have just averaged those pixels and created a new array. Does that make sense? It's exactly the same patterning that we were looking at before. So given that, let's, let's just write, try to write the equation for this. So if I was going to do image upper as image upper, you guys can't see over there. How do I index that out of my image? Or right, let's not do upper, let's do center first. Image center, so this blue one. What's the indexing operation I'm gonna to do to cut that out? One minus one, the first slice. The first slice is gonna be starting at the index zero, one. And then the minus one, so that's going to be in rows. We're going to go colon one to negative one, exactly. How about in columns? This way. Same. Same thing. If I do image upper, I have IMG. <clears throat> that's up here. Now, how are we going to index that one in rows? Starts at the beginning. Colon, what was I heard somebody over here? Minus one, two, minus two. Minus. Yeah, so if we're minus one, that only gets us to here. Minus two would end us right there. So we do colon minus two. And intuitively, this sort of makes sense because these two images should be the same size, right? If I cut off one in the beginning and one off the end of this one, this one also has to be too smaller to be the same size. And so we've stopped here and cut off the last two. And that will start from the beginning and go to the end. How do I do the uh, columns? What's the column? Same. same as the previous. One colon minus one. Would positive two be the same? In this example, it would. Just because it's because I have such a small thing. But if you write it this way with these negative values, 
It works for this, and it also works for your satellite imagery that's 4,096 by 4,096. So you're set, all right? You've done one, uh, uh, one kind of formula that works for anything. And so now, if we're going to make my averaged image over here, image A is going to be image uh, center plus image upper, and divide that by 2. All right. Does that make sense how we've done that? All right. So this is a great example of how, again, we don't write any for loops. The for loops are implicit in how this slicing occurs and then our mathematical operations on those. And by doing that, you get very fast operations. Okay? This will be, if you do this with uh, a five point stencil, uh, you know, in that, all you have to do to think about that is you're going to have an image over here and then an image down here and then the last one over here. You would add all of those together and then divide by five instead. And that would give you your five point stencil operation. Now, some of you may be going, I would never do this. I would use a convolution filter with a kernel and that's great. That's exactly what you would do using ND image or Scikit's image or one of those tools. Uh, but then you wouldn't have taught anybody anything about indexing. So that would have been a horrible example here, right? Uh, that would be the way you would do things quickly. It's just uh, this is an alternative and it gives you a good example of how to do this. And how would you build the total updated image? Because you've got certain things that, you know, the corners were not included. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, you can think about this either as a new image, which is the smooth and uh, original. It's going to be smaller, right? It's this smaller section of this. Or replace it in the original. Or you could go and replace it in the original. If you do that... You have to use slice assignment, don't you? That's right. So you could do, in that case, if you wanted to stick it back in there, you have IMG. You would take IMG... And what would my slice assignment look like, actually? One minus one. One minus, one colon what? Minus, minus one, one. And then repeat that. One colon minus one. And then say equals image A. That's exactly right. Does that make sense? Once you've done, we're assigning that back into the middle here and we're replacing and overriding those original pixels. Whether that's what you want to do is completely up to your application. Uh, but that is uh, uh, certainly one way of doing it. All right? Great. Okay. We've done slices of references. Let's talk about file formats right quick. <coughs> or file reading. I have a quick question before you leave. Please. This might be a little bit off topic. I'm, but I'm just kind of wondering, is there a way to apply So there are this apply. <clears throat> apply itself is a generic Python. That's not what you're going to be looking for because it's going to be a sl slow. But apply along axis and apply over axis allows you to specify a Python function and, and apply it across that axis. That may be what you're looking for. Yeah, I'm just looking for something that's faster than a for loop that would still apply to every element. Yeah, so this is not going to be blazing fast because what's going to get cre underneath the covers any time that you make your function in Python and then you're calling it on every element, you're kind of screwed on the speed side. I mean, it's going underneath the covers, it may do it a little faster than your for loop, but not a whole lot faster. Um, because one of the main costs in Python is in function call overhead. So anytime you have to call a Python function, you're paying a penalty. And if you're doing that on a billion elements, then you pay that cost a billion times. <clears throat> so in those cases, um, you know, what we'll end up doing is we'll prototype things in Python and then we'll move things either into Cython or into C that need to be really fast along a specific axis. And that's our solution. 
All right. You may also look into things like Numba. It may help uh, on some of those things. But um, Cython certainly does, and so will. Uh, uh, Cython, and then, of course, C always helps, <laughs> right, uh, on things. All right, other questions on it? All right, so reading data from files. That's, so we're creating all of our arrays on the fly. The reality is most of you, as soon as you go back to your office, you'll, you, know, you can do examples by creation, but you need to read some data in. How do you get it in? And there are a couple of ways. Well, there are a lot of ways of reading data in. The basic pattern for reading files is you go and open a file in Python, and this ex I'm expecting you to have had our Python part of the course, I guess, by now, which you haven't, but hopefully you are familiar with Python. I'm going to create an array or a list here, excuse me, very clearly a list called data, and then I'm going to read line by line through my file, and then I'm going to split up my line, convert, uh, and that's splitting on, you know, this is our data set here. Well, let's see, not in this case. Our data set in this is just expecting a very simple, uh, you know, column-based set of data. Uh, we're going to split on white space, convert everything to a float, and that creates every line then is going to become a, a list of floating point values. And then look at this. We append that row of data to our full data set. And so every line is going to be a row of data that we're reading in, and we just build up this long list of lists. It's not an array. We're reading this into a list of lists to begin with. And then at the very end, we call conversion array on our data, and that will convert that data over. Now, are we going to have two copies of the data in memory then? You absolutely will with this example. That's right. And, um, you know, the only way to avoid that sort of thing is to do something where you read the file once and learn how big it is, but don't read all the data in. Just go and read the number of lines or, and, the, and the width of those. Allocate a memory array and then uh, or allocate your NumPy array and then read your data directly into the NumPy array. That would be an option for doing that. So you can resize NumPy arrays in very specific situations. And every time that you add a row, you're going to do a remalloc of the entire array. So you're much better off, really. I think about NumPy arrays as being something that you never change the shape of. It's just, it is this really elegant, efficient way of representing a block of memory and doing operations on it quickly. But an operation like reading in, you're going to want to do that with a, with a data structure that can expand, and lists are built explicitly for doing that. They have an append method and, and are, are uh, efficient memory-wise for doing that. So I read everything into a, NumPy, or into a, a Python list and then move it over to an array as the last step. <clears throat> now, if you, there are a lot of places where you'll run into uh, performance issues with, I mean, you'll have, like if you're running into uh, reading in meshes, for example, people give you meshes with 20 million vector or, or vertices and connectivity and that sort of stuff. This is going to be slow to read it in. So I'll write an explicit reader for those uh, with a little bit of C and that uses scanf or whatever to read in the elements and build an array out uh, automatically that way. That's a, you know, that's again dropping down to C, but that's one way of doing this. Cython works as well. Um, you can also use these methods, which aren't necessarily, um, so the big win of using something like load text, or there's another one called gen from text. The, the big win there is not on a memory savings basis, it's on a your time savings basis, right? They, these things, instead of you having to write a reader for every one of your file formats, if your file format is generally sane, then one of these will work. Uh, load text works pretty well. And so the way to look, play with load text, I think, is just to look at it. So load text takes a file name. You can specify the data type of your data. 
You can specify if there's a kind of comment row that you might have. Uh, you can specify the delimiter, uh, delimiter that separates your data, if it's a comma or a space uh, or white space. You can actually specify a converter function that will go through and convert, uh, be called. It's a Python function that would be called on every element to, to change it. You can tell it that, you know what, I have a header in this data, I want to skip a certain number of rows. You could skip a certain set of columns. There's all sorts of things that you can do here. And we'll do a quick exercise with this, and I'll just, um, let's just look at, uh, this is the world's simplest data, float data text, all right? And when I open this, you'll notice that Canopy switched over to the right directory. So I'm actually sitting there in that directory. And uh, I can say load text. And pay attention, this is like getting uh, your uh, hints for your test, right? Because we're going to be doing this exact same thing in the exercise. Load text. If you just call load text on a data set that looks like this, it works perfectly, right? There's no, nothing you have to do. It defaults to using white space in between the characters. Um, and uh, it just starts reading the rows. Every row is the same link that reads that out and gives that to you as your data. And you'll notice that by default, it's going to give it to you as floating point data. So. If you didn't want that to be floating point data, then you could come in and say, I want the D type to be int 32. <coughs> and now it would read it in, and instead of converting everything to a float, they would come in. It looks very similar, except it doesn't have the period on each one of these. Those are int 32 array. The result is an int 32 array. If you get a slightly more complicated data set, here's one that has some column or headers on it. Then you can come along and say load text, what is this float data with header? And if I try to read that, I'm going to get an ex uh, ex uh, error because it says, listen, I read in this thing that looks like it's C1. Uh, you can see where it got it right there. And I'm trying to convert it to a float, and I can't do it, which makes sense. C1 doesn't make sense as a float. But we really don't want it to read in that row. So we can come in and say, you know what? I want you to skip rows, skip the first row. And if you skip two, then it will start at the third line and so on. All right? So here is a much more complicated version of the file or of a file. And this one, we probably want to skip the first row. We want to mark anything that starts with the percent as a comment. Uh, and you might even choose here, we don't really care about this column. We just want the other columns. That would require you to specify a whole lot more um, of the fields. If you get that one done, great. If you don't, no big deal. Just try to quickly go and re. this is called load text. And you're going to start with uh, an example here. We've imported load text for you and read in this data and then read in that data and just print out those arrays, okay? And if you get done really quickly, try the bonus. And we'll spend 10 minutes on this. It, it's really, uh, I just did most of it for you or I did everything for you except for the exercise. But it's worth playing with and looking at that. You may even wanna go in and modify some of those files, putting commas in or something like that and seeing how you would read that. It's a chance to just play for a minute. All right, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, so it's writing them out in scientific notation is what that is. So you get uh, the full complement of all the zeros and everything there that are in the mantissa, and then you have the E and the exponential part after that. Cool? All right. 
Now, one other comment I'll make uh, before we go on. There are a lot of tools for reading and writing data. You just mentioned um, uh, save to text and using that. <clears throat> I will uh, recommend that you use save Z and save and save Z more often. Those are going to be binary file writers uh, for NumPy arrays if you have large data sets. If you need to write it out to text, then uh, save text will work. Um, but those tools really work for uh, dealing with larger data sets quite nicely. Um, and they're kind of low overhead. On the other hand, we also use, like you don't have to have any external libraries and that sort of thing. Uh, they work from version of Python to ver or version of NumPy to version of NumPy, which is really handy. I'll also point out HDF. We use HDF a whole lot uh, for writing out a lot of binary data. Um, and it's really handy for that sort of thing. There are a lot of different file readers that, you know, within SciPy and uh, PyTables has the HDF, H5Py, we use that as well. If you're in a certain domain, you may, you know, like NetCDF or look around. The, the chances that, that you have a reader already written for your file format is quite high. Uh, unless it's a commercial format that, that people haven't run into. <clears throat> but FITS data formats for astronomy, you know, all the image file formats, most of those are readable. Uh, there's just a whole lot out there. And, and they're all listed kind of down here as places you can get them. But really, just look around instead of writing a reader yourself. The other thing that I'll comment on is I got a question back here about column data. What if I have something and I really want to have the column instead of just deleting the column off the top? I want to have that column name associated with that column of data. How can I do that? And you can actually do it with NumPy and load text. The way that you would do that is create a special D type called a uh, structured array. And it can actually have heterogeneous data and you can reference it by column. Um, that's a fairly advanced usage, and for 99.9, .9, well, maybe just 99% of the cases, you really, if you're going to do that, you'd really rather have a pandas data frame anyways, all right? The only time that I would really advise you to go with the NumPy data structure is if you're uh, dealing with binary data on a, for, a file that you're trying to memory map or something like that, or you're really concerned about performance. And for some reason, you can do that better by knowing everything about your array. Uh, so Pandas has really stepped in and provided an incredible tool uh, for dealing with that columnar data. So, and the other thing that's cool about Pandas is it has awesome readers. Uh, it's, it's readers for pulling data in are, are both efficient uh, and um, uh, handle a whole wide range of types of data. Okay, question? Uh, does it work the same? Um, no, it doesn't work the same, but it work because pandas extends the notion of having an index instead of an integer index. You can index it with your own kind of data. So it could be dates, and you could ask for all the data between some dates. So it's not quite the same. On the other hand, you can ask for this thing called IX that indexes it like it's a NumPy array. Uh, underneath the covers, it is using NumPy heavily. So they're not exactly the same, but there's a lot of similarities. There were, there were a couple of other hands raised. I don't know if those were questions or people stretching or faking me out. Nothing else? Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna have to blaze here. We'll do this, we have one last example, which is actually, uh, um, It'll, it'll take you some effort, so we'll try to get through this really quickly. The notion here, maybe we can do this for 10 minutes and you'll have 20 minutes plus your lunch break because you're so excited about getting finished to do the exercise, right? That's what you're gonna do. Nobody, nobody, okay. Well, maybe you can do it tonight before, for your bedtime reading. Um, fancy indexing. The idea here is sometimes you don't just want this very regular pattern 
like breaking, pulling something out that's all contiguous memory or all strided in a specific way. And to manage this, there's this notion of fancy indexing or fancy slicing. Um, you'll hear it called both. Here, if we have the array A, 0 to 80, uh, with 10, stepping by 10, that'll create this array with 0 through 70 in it for me. And then what if I wanted to pull out index 1, 2, and the index negative 3? Those are highlighted down here. How would I do that? Well, I can make those as a sequence. And then I can use that sequence of values of integers here directly by indexing into A with that sequence of integers. And if I do that, that is going to return to me a Y array that just has those values, 10, 20, and 50 in it. All right? That's really cool. It's a very powerful concept. Uh, it also has a gotcha associated with it, and that is that whenever you use this fancy approach, either indexing with a set of integers or with the mask that I'm about to talk about, you're going to get a copy. We just talked about how everything was a reference, and here I am, the next slide, telling you you get a copy in this case. And that turns out to be because of how NumPy is represented underneath. We're not going to have time to talk about that. But uh, just know that with all the standard slicing that we've been talking about, where you use kind of colon notation, you're always going to get a reference back. If you go in and hand in a set of indices that are integers or Booleans as you're indexing, you're going to get a copy of your data back. Okay? All right, so we can grab these indices. Here's how you're going to use this a whole lot. And I'll just give you an example uh, instead of uh, that image. All right, oh, that's a wonderful boring array. Let's get a little more exciting. Lin space. So I have an array. With elements um, 0 to pi to pi here. And then I can come in and say B is equal to sine of A. And we can say plot A versus B. And we're going to get That's why I have close all often at the top of things. Here we have our plot here. Okay, so, so there's our plot. What if somebody asked you for all the values where B was greater than zero? That would be all the values in this first cycle or first half cycle of the data. I can come in and say, where is B greater than or equal to zero? And that gives me back a true false array. True wherever the value is greater than or equal to zero, false where it wasn't. And this array is the same length as B. So it's just giving you an answer back for every element. Makes sense, right? So I can come in and assign mask. I'll make an array called mask where B is greater than or equal to zero. And so mask is just that true false array. Now I could come in and say, well, let's plot those. I want to plot X where that mask is true versus Y where that mask is true and do that with red circles. And what did I do wrong? Yeah. You changed the name to A, B, I, Y. Well, there you have it. Oh. Where did I? Uh... There's not X and Y, Xavier. For the last line, you wanted to change the X and Y to A. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I hear what you're saying, but I can't figure out where you're talking about. Yeah. All right. We'll ignore this flub up here, and we'll get these dots here, right? So that gives you the dots that were greater than or equal to zero. This is super handy. This gives you a way to query your data in this really powerful way. And if you have mask, you could go, where is... You can do this where I said B greater than or equal to zero. That gave me a mass, but I could say B greater than or equal to zero and something like A is less than or equal to pi divided by four. And now I'm querying on two values. The one thing I have to do if I do this 
is I have to put parentheses around this. And the reason that I have to do that is because uh, order of operation, the and binds tighter than these comparison operators. But if you put those around that, then you ought to get just those first values out of the cycle. All right? So, and so we could come in and, and uh, assign that to mask. And you could come in and say plot that mask, but with green. And that ought to give us this first set of values. Not sure why I didn't get that one, but. Is that working? Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. So this is a really powerful feature. It's the way that you can go in and, and basically do SQL type queries out of your data or something like that. Use it all the time. It's very efficient. So you'll do this, grab that data, um, and you often people will uh, do this and then they'll, um, or, or often people will try to take these masks and convert them to indices. Most of the time you don't need to do that. Only sometimes you need to do that. You can index directly with this Boolean mask that you've created, okay? All right, so that's fancy indexing, and you can use it in multiple dimensions here. Uh, as an example, what if you wanted to get, for example, this diagonal? We're not getting the main diagonal, we're getting this off diagonal. Well, the way that you can do this is provide a set of rows and a set of columns. You can think about zipping these two things together to get the coordinates that you're going to pull out. We're going to get the 0, 1 element, which is this one, the 1, 2 element, which is this one, the 2, 3 element, the 3, 4, and the 4, 5. So the rows and the columns, those have to be the same length, right, uh, when you're getting those. Really handy way to grab a diagonal. It's also an awesome way to set a diagonal. If you're doing some kind of PDE solution and you have a diagonal uh, like this that you're trying to fill in the, the diagonals, this is one way to do that. Oftentimes, they'll all be the same element. So that's one solution. Here's an example where we're combining in two dimensions. We're going to use a normal slice for the rows, so from 3 to the end. But then I only want 0, index 2, and index 5 columns, so it's going to pull these specific columns out. And you can do a same sort of thing with a mask here where I just want to go and grab out of the index two column, that's this one, I only want to grab from the index zero, or the places where the ones are, and that's the index zero, index two, and the index negative one column, or rows. And that'll pull those guys out. All right? How would you grab a diagonal if you had arbitrary uh, size? Yeah, so, one, it's a little more complicated, uh, or you have to do a little bit of math. There's, if you just want to grab a diagonal, then uh, so if I have this, I can just go in and ask for the diagonal and that'll give it to me. Or I can ask for the diagonal one, and that'll give me the upper off-axis diagonal. Or you can go and ask for the axis negative one, and that will give you the lower diagonal off-axis. So that's one of the tools that you can use. The drawback to this is this is a retriever, and not a, a, it doesn't allow you to set the values. So this is reading the values, not writing them. If you want to write, then you're going to have to do a little bit of math. And you're going to have to create your own indices based on the shape and, and, and so forth. I don't know of another way of doing it. All right? OK. So what about incomplete indexing with, you remember, we've done this we talked about this a little earlier. If you just, if you have a two-dimensional array and you index it with one value, then that's going to be the rows, right? So here we're asking for colon three. It's actually not technically rows because this could be three or four or five dimensions, whatever dimensional you want. It's going to be whatever the first dimension is. Rows are the first dimension here. So it's going to pull off and select all of the columns 
and the first three rows. If, on the other hand, this is some mass that we've set up, a Boolean condition like 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, this is only going to grab the rows out of A that match these, the ones. All right? So here, this will pull those values out, and they'll stick them in a new array for you called Y. Cool? This is really handy. We're going to do an example right now after I talk about one other thing, where we're gonna have a table basically of data, columns of data. And I'm gonna give you a criteria on one of the columns, but then I'm gonna want you, based on the columns, we're gonna be looking at, at uh, Dow Jones historical data, and you're gonna to wanna to find which rows have a volume, you have high, low, open, closed prices, which rows have a volume of greater than five billion shares or something like that, I can't remember exactly what it is, but. Well, then what you might want to do is go and create a new data set with only those rows in it. So you create a mass based on the volume column, and now you can do exactly what we've done here to get a subset of only the days that were that high volume day. All right? That's one way of doing things. There will always be multiple ways of solving the problem, but that's one. I'm going to skip over that and just talk about this last piece because it will come out, uh, come back. Um, come up in certain cases. If we have a Boolean mask, here we've created an array with 0, 12, 5, and 20 in it. Imagine I ask you for the values where A is greater than 10. Well, that's going to be true for 12 and 20, which give us true values here. Sometimes you're going to want to know not just the Boolean mask, but actually what indices was this true at. All right? So in this case, it's true at index 1 and index 3. And so if you use where was A greater than 10, this will go through and evaluate any place where there's a non-zero or a non-false value, and it will give you back those things. So it's really the same thing as non-zero, which is another function, uh, but it returns this. Now be careful with it. What data type did it return? What's that? It does return a NumPy array, but it has it's actually contained in something. It's in a tuple or tuple, whichever way you pronounce it. Uh, so I have an array that's inside of this tuple. And if I want, most of the time when you're dealing with 1D arrays like this, this is a pain in the rear. And so you will see people doing this. Where, if I do I have a mask here, where is my mask true? and then they'll put a little zero out here that just gets that first element out of the tuple and gives it to you, all right? So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of quirky that you see in code, and this is why you see it. Now, the reason that NumPy does this is to be consistent. If you have a two-dimensional array, it needs to return you a tuple so they can return to you rows and columns or a three-dimensional row, you know, all of those values just happens in this degenerate case of a 1D array, you really don't like its default behavior. So you'll have to do this, all right? So that may come up. Okay, we have 18 minutes, and everybody I can tell is so excited to do our next exercise. Thank you, I appreciate that. It's called Dow Selection, okay? And in Dow selection, you're going to get a data set that looks like this. It's just a CSV file with uh, open, high, low, close for the starting 200 odd days or so of, um, I think it was 2008. Um, and it was in happier days of 2008. It was pre-crash. So, the data looks like this. I think we've read it in for you. Your task is going to be outlined down below. I think we've done zero for you. Um, I want you to create a mask of arrays that indicates which rows have a volume greater than 5.5 billion. So you'll notice index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the volume column. So you want to look for where index, the index column 4 has a greater than 5.5 billion. 
And then I want you to tell me how many of those are. Now, if you have a true false array, just like my mask here, one of the things I can do is say sum of mask. And any true value is going to add up to 1, and any false value is 0. So that actually gives you an answer. That's one way of doing this. You could also do it other ways, but, but that gives you a, uh, one approach. And then find the index of every row where the volume is greater than 5.5 billion. And we just talked about where and some of the little tricks that you're going to have to pull with that. And this bonus is, um, for you guys, this is required reading. This isn't a bonus, all right? So uh, you'll get points taken off if you don't do the bonus. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is plot, plot the adjusted close, which is the very last column. So plot the adjusted close for every day in 2008 that we have. Like, we don't have every day in 2008, so it's technically not every day. But all the data you have. And now I want you to overplot a red dot on top of each of the locations where the volume was greater than 5.5 billion. So this is a little bit interesting. I'm asking you to plot adjusted close, but then I'm asking you to plot a red dot, again, the adjusted close, for the days where the volume is high. All right, so you're, you're using volume to select, but you're never plotting volume, okay? Now, let's just look right quick at what it should look like with our secret, secret solution. Oh, and also look here, we've given you the indices. If you want to, to make your code more readable, you could choose to use these for your column names instead of specific indices. But if we run that, you should get a plot that looks something like this. All right? All right, off you go. And we have about 15 minutes. I think that ought to be enough time to work with your partner and um, at least get through the first parts and hopefully the bonus. <clears throat> All right, so the solution here. We're going to load in the data. We've already done that for you. And then the next thing was to find where was the Dow a high volume day. And so we just select out all the rows here. So we go from the beginning to the end, and we get the volume column. And we check where is that greater than 5.5 e to the ninth. And it's much easier to put 5.5 e to the ninth than 5. Point, or 5 comma 5 0 0 comma 0 0 0 comma 0. You are always going to miss, right? on your zeros. So um, uh, try to use exponential when you're running into those big numbers. And then you can come in, and I, the next thing is, how many high volume days are there? Well, we can sum up this mask, and the true values are going to sum up. Then we're going to print the vo Dow volume as greater than 5.5 billion on which days. All right? And then we have a high volume index. Where is this high volume mask true? So this will give us the days or the indices of the days where we had that high volume mask, true, where it was true. And you remember, the where will return this, but we have this little uh, trick at the end to make sure that you're pulling out the first element of that tuple. So that will give us our indices. And the place where this is useful is in the bonus, which wasn't a bonus. You're going to plot the Dow and do it for the adjusted close across all of the days, that's all of the rows, and do that as a blue line. And then what we want to do is we want to plot the adjusted close on those high volume index days, but plot those as a red zero. And the way that we get those lined up correctly is, here we just plotted this against its index, right? So this is just going to have the adjusted close on the y-axis and the index on the x. By saying plot, and now we give it actually an x value, use these indices for the x values. This is the y, and we're going to select out the adjusted close associated with those indices and plot those with the red zero. That will give us our plot that looks like this. All right? 
Okay? Yes. This one. I didn't hear. I was just wanting to get a true false value uh, at this point. And, and so um, the only reason I really need to get the use the where is actually because I wanted to do the plot down here. Uh, but typically, you can just use the mask. We just needed to know what days those were also on. Let me make one other comment. So um, we missed, basically, we did everything except for um, one, or we missed a couple of major concepts, um, but really only one that, that you need to to kind of get to, to level two. I guess, and very, you'll cover 99% of your use cases if you get comfortable with array calculation methods, okay? So this starts on, I, I think my numbers line up for you, but 181. If you will look over 181, 182, 183, 184, and then work on the wind statistics example, and this will take you a while, all right? This is a great exercise, though. If you understand indexing, how we've shown that, and how you use that to write implicit loops, you understand fancy indexing, which gives you this great way to select data out, kind of your SQL query uh, through your data, uh, and then you understand how to do computations, like sums and means and those sorts of things, along the axes of arrays, then you're really, you've got the tool set that you need to do most work, and then file reading as well. But that'll cover it. So you're one short. The other one that I'll mention is broadcasting. Uh, and, and that's really nice if you're starting to get into trying to figure out clever ways of writing your code a little more concisely. But it's not absolutely required that you understand it. All right? All right, so I think uh, that's it. Thank you for coming. And uh, what was, oh, he's gone. Uh, from, uh, what was it, Ty by, what was it? What was it? Ty, how are you? Ty, how are you? Thank you. Sounds like the, uh, the key place to go. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Enjoy your afternoon. I hope to see you around at the conference. Thanks.